the legacy of James Smithson. My name is Emily Neckrish, and I served as the project manager for the web exhibition, Smithson to Smithsonian, which we'll be discussing today. Before we get started, I want to gratefully acknowledge the Piscataway tribe on whose ancestral homelands I live and work, as well as the diverse and vibrant Native communities who make their homes here today. I'm going to introduce today's speakers in a couple of minutes, but before I do that, I wanted to share with you all a little bit about the history of this project. The original Smithson to Smithsonian, well then it was actually called From Smithson to Smithsonian, was published in 1996 to coincide with the Smithsonian's 150th anniversary. I'm going to pop that link into the chat so that you can explore the digital exhibition in all of its 1990s glory. That version explored the life of James Smithson, debates about what an institution for the increase and diffusion of knowledge would look like, and the institution's first decades after its founding. Since then, we've learned so much more about Smithson, the man, especially thanks to some of our speakers today, and we have more fully re-examined our own institutional history. So as the Smithsonian geared up to celebrate its 175th anniversary in 2021 and 2022, we decided to share that new research by revamping Smithson to Smithsonian. We're so thankful to staff at the Smithsonian Libraries and Archives who provided feedback on the many versions of this web exhibition, as well as to the Smithsonian's 175th committee for their generous support of our work. And now let me tell you a little bit about our speakers today. Heather Ewing is the author of The Lost World of James Smithson, Science, Revolution, and the Birth of the Smithsonian. A research associate of the Smithsonian Archives since 2000, and she was the lead historian uh, and writer on the new Smithson to Smithsonian web exhibition. She is the Associate Dean for Administrative Affairs at the New York Studio School. Stephen Turner is a historian and emeritus curator at the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History. His recent book, The Science of James Smithson, published by the Smithsonian Press in 2020, is a detailed study of Smithson's scientific writings in the context in which he worked. Leslie K. Overstreet earned a bachelor's degree in English literature and a master of arts in teaching from Reed College and held jobs as a teacher and a writer editor before joining the Smithsonian Libraries and Archives in 1980. She earned an MLS degree in rare book librarianship at the University of Maryland in 1988. And as the curator of the Natural History Rare Books, she has headed the Joseph F. Coleman Third Library of Natural History since it opened in 2002. And now I'll turn it over to Heather. Thank you so much, Emily and Aaron. Um, and thank you to everyone joining us today. It's really a pleasure to be with you and to have the chance to talk about James Smithson with some wonderful colleagues. I'm honored to have been invited to be part of creating this new website for the Smithsonian's 175th and pleased to have a chance to preview it with you this evening. I imagine many of you um, on this Zoom are familiar with the curious origin story of the Smithsonian. Uh, for those of you who are not so familiar, it begins in this country, at least, in 1835, when the United States government learned to its utter amazement that an English scientist who had never set foot in the United States and who did not seem to have any connections to this country, had left his fortune uh, to the US to found, in his words from the will, at Washington under the name of the Smithsonian Institution, an establishment for the increase and diffusion of knowledge among men. From the very beginning, there were many questions about who Smithson was and why he would make such a bequest. So this new website will introduce James Smithson and his family history and touch a little on how that shaped his life and legacy. Smithson's mother was a wealthy widow descended from an ancient English family, the Hungerfords, and that's a story described in depth in an excellent web exhibit about a document at the Smithsonian Archives called the Hungerford Deed, which you're looking at here. And that website launched earlier during this 175th anniversary year. And you can explore it both through this website here, as you can see, or through the Smithsonian Archives web, website homepage. 
Elizabeth Macy, Smithson's mother, knew her family tree out to its most distant branches, and she instilled in her son the idea that he was descended from kings and destined for great things. And one of the relations that she claimed through this tree was Elizabeth Percy, the woman who became the Duchess of Northumberland. Her husband, Hugh Smithson, who became the Duke of Northumberland, was the man who became Smithson's father. And Elizabeth Macy went off to Paris to have the child in secret when she realized that she was pregnant. Smithson was never publicly acknowledged by his famous father, a fact that weighed very heavily on him in the society he was growing up in, one that prized ancestry, the aristocracy, wealth, and power. The Duke was much admired, one of the wealthiest men in England, a major landholder, and an important patron of both the arts and the sciences. The next section of the website um, explores the importance of science in Smithson's life and the ways that it might have shaped his worldview and his ideas about a Smithsonian institution. When I was working on my biography of James Smithson, Stephen Turner was a curator at NMNH and was incredibly helpful in illuminating Smithson's scientific work. This is no easy feat. At a time when Smithson went to Oxford in the 1780s, oxygen was known as deflogisticated air. And the language of many of Smithson's scientific papers, when you read them today, is pretty inscrutable and archaic. Steve became so intrigued by James Smithson that he set about replicating all of Smithson's published experiments. His new book is an amazing window into what Smithson was up to in his laboratory. And so he can share more with you now about Smithson science. Thanks, Heather. It's, it's great to be here. Um, in talking about Smithson and his science, it's important to remember that science was not something that Smithson ever did to make a living. Science was never his job, and it was never a source of income for him. After all, he was independently wealthy and never needed to worry about making money. Instead, for Smithson, science was more about who he was and what he would do with his life. Smithson saw himself not as a worker, but as a philosopher, an investigator of the natural world. And the topics he studied were intended to get at the fundamental nature of that world. And for Smithson, this all started with chemistry. Smithson discovered chemistry as a teenager, probably around the age of 16 or 17, and his interest in it only increased as he got older. He had other scientific interests, of course, especially mineralogy, but most of his work was ultimately related in some way or another to chemistry. Smithson's early attachment to this subject is striking and, and somewhat surprising for a, a teenage boy. And in one of his articles, Smithson spoke about this. He credited his, his interest in chemistry to conversations he'd had with his father, who was deeply interested in the, in the subject and who knew many of the leading English chemists. Now, this all sign, sounds fine until we remember that Smithson was born out of wedlock. And so the person he's talking about was his natural father, the Duke of Northumberland. And as Heather just reminded us, the Duke was one of the richest and best connected men in England. It's unfortunate that we don't know more about the relationship, but for a while at least, this larger than life character seems to have taken young Smithson under his wing. There's even some evidence that the Duke encouraged Smithson to attend this private chemistry school as shown here on the slide, uh, the school which catered to gentlemen and, and, uh, and the well-to-do. The Duke was in a business relationship with Dr. Higgins, the man who ran this school. Smithson's relationship with his father seems to have been very important to him, quite understandably, and at least in Smithson's view, their bond was based on chemistry. And given that, it hardly seems like a coincidence by the, that by the time he was 19, Smithson was well on his way towards a life in science. People who met Smithson described him as being brilliant and energetic, with a wide-ranging curiosity and an encyclopedic memory for anything related to science. He had a knack for impressing people, especially other chemists, and throughout his life, he corresponded with some of the most important scientific figures of his time. 
For example, Smithson was just starting his sophomore year at Oxford when he went to Scotland on his first scientific expedition. Along the way, they stopped in Edinburgh, where Smithson spent a few days with two eminent scientists, James Hutton and Joseph Black, who are shown in this slide. He was just 18, and they were both in their 50s, but they accepted him as a colleague, and Smithson exchanged letters with both of them for the rest of their lives. This sort of thing seemed to happen to him everywhere he went. Smithson would ultimately publish 26 scientific articles on a wide range of topics, and he is credited with having made several important discoveries. He also introduced, introduced several improvements to scientific instruments and is regarded as one of the fathers of microchemistry, a, a separate branch of chemistry. Eventually, he miniaturized his equipment to the point that he could carry most of it in the pockets of his coat. And in this slide, uh, you can see two of Smithson's instruments. On the left is a replica of the wax lamp that he used as a heat source, and on the right is his miniature balance. Unlike the large stationary instruments that most chemists use, Smithson developed instruments that were light, compact, and could withstand the rigors of travel. He literally crafted his science to fit his nomadic lifestyle, which is an important point because it seems that Smithson was almost always traveling. Indeed, Smithson had remarkably few roots. He never married and doesn't seem to have had any close domestic relationships other than the company of a few trusted servants. Although he was wealthy, he never owned a house and never lived in one place for more than a few years, often much less. On several occasions, events forced him to be on the road for years at a time. And at one point he was even in prison, but through it all, he somehow managed to continue his scientific investigations. Much of Smithson's travel was done either on horseback or in carriages as in, in the image you see here. Um, this is uh, post chase, uh, the type of carriage that Smithson would have taken on his expedition to Scotland. Even on good roads, it could, take, it could take days or even weeks to get anywhere. Smithson usually traveled with just the company of a single servant and the isolation that he must have experienced while he traveled is hard to imagine today but it was alleviated somewhat by correspondence. Mail service in Smithson's time was complicated and not always reliable, but, but Smithson, like most of his colleagues, was an avid letter writer. And he used this medium of exchange, I mean, to exchange information and to stay connected. In this respect, Smithson seems to have played a unique role in the science of his time, collecting and dispersing information as he traveled. Smithson never chose to engage in politics or religion or many of the other things that uh, concern ordinary people. Instead, he saw himself as a member of a unique and uniquely important social group, the scientific community. And it was his membership in this far-flung community that gave purpose to his life and which ultimately made him a citizen of the world. Thanks, Steve. And that is, as you can see, the title of one of the earlier um, sections. Uh, and um, the section that we're looking at now, the bequest, looks, of course, at how the Smithsonian came to be, from Smithson writing his extraordinary will um, through to the debates in Congress, which lasted nearly a decade as um, the House of Representatives and senators tried to figure out what exactly an institution for the increase and diffusion of knowledge should be. So one of the more intriguing documents in the Smithsonian archives uh, is an inventory of belongings that Smithson had with him at the time of his death in Genoa. And we're looking at that now. Um, and uh, there are a number of other inventories as well that, that list other belongings of his, including one that was made in 1838. Uh, this one obviously from 1829 when he died. In 1838, Richard Rush uh, was the agent who was sent to England on behalf of the US government to claim the Smithson fortune. And when he was ready to embark to return to the United States, bringing with him the bequest 
in gold coins, um, along with a lot of Smithson's belongings, there was another inventory made. And um, among all those items that came to the US were diaries of Smithson that he had kept since he was a teenager and more than 200 unpublished papers along with his mineral collection, scientific instruments and many other objects. And as you can imagine, this material would have been really terrific to have when you're writing a biography. Um, however, it pretty much all perished in a terrible fire at the Smithsonian in 1865. And that makes the materials that Leslie Overstreet is the curator of Smithson's library, especially significant. So here's Leslie to talk about Smithson's library. Thanks, Heather. Hello? We can Am hear I? you. Yes, oh, you can. all good. Okay. Yep. good. I'll, I'll go ahead. Um, Yes, the uh, Smithson's personal library was one of the very few things that survived the disastrous 1865 fire because they were, the books were in another wing of the building, thank heavens. This is um, the case of books in the Regents Room in the 1890s, I'm told, and here it is much more recently um, in the, what we called the Jewett Room in the Arts and Industries building. Uh, you can see that these have uh, slip cases. These are all leather spine slip cases that the institution provided for the books. The, um, we'll see them in reverse in a few minutes. Now, the institution published an official list of the library in 1880. There were 116 titles listed and a few more have been found recently, as I'll be explaining in a minute. So we currently list 126 titles, totaling about 200 separate volumes in the Smithson Library. And they're currently held in the high security vault of the James, uh, sorry, Joseph F. Coleman III Library of Natural History in the Natural History Museum, but part of the Smithsonian Libraries and Archives. The collection has none of the classic Latin or Greek texts that educated gentlemen would have owned, no religion or philosophy, no Bible, and only two works of literature held in, I think, for other reasons, actually. But instead, the library consists of about a dozen general and household books, uh, Johnson's Dictionary of 1755, a cookbook, actually two cookbooks, one you see here, uh, auction catalogs for books and mineral collections, and a few miscellaneous items like that. Then there are about 40 travel and history books, mostly related to French politics and memoirs, but also tourist guidebooks and even a few museum guides. But over half of the books, are on science. There we go. Thank you, Emily. Uh, 69 titles out of the 126 are of, on scientific subjects, mainly chemistry and mineralogy, by the leading scientists of the time, many of whom Smithson knew and worked with. At least 20 of the science titles are actually journal off prints produced separately for the author to distribute to colleagues. Smithson took an active part in this common method of scientific communication. A dozen of the off prints in the library were inscribed to him by their authors. And he had a stack of 14 copies of his own article on the composition of zeolite from the Royal Society's Philosophical Transactions, published in 1811, that he would send out in exchange. So Smithson's was a very practical working library. Um, at least 62 of the books have his penciled marks or annotations. Here we see one image from the website itself, um, one of uh, the works of Samuel Johnson that mentions Annick, the home of the Duke of Northumberland. And you see a, just a tiny little mark in the margin. Um, another kind of annotation is in the next image. 
where it's so faint, Heather must have gone blind trying to read all of these things when she was researching them, but very faint pencil marks in the margin commenting on the text. To me, though, as a librarian, the most striking aspect of the library is the bindings, or rather, in many cases, the lack of bindings. Almost 90% of the titles and an even greater proportion of the individual volumes are in their original paper wrappers or boards or have no covers at all. Now, I'll explain that um, before the early and mid 1800s, books weren't necessarily sold bound into hardcovers and ready to read the way we expect to see them nowadays. In Smithson's day, books were sold halfway along. The sheets temporarily sewn into a text block that was protected from soiling by simple paper wrappers or paper covered pasteboards. Finishing the binding was left to the choice and the pocketbook of the buyer. And the common practice before the mid 19th century was to have them properly bound in leather. But in Smithson's collection, only 16 titles are bound in half or full leather. And here, whoop, back one, there you go. <laughs> here you can see um, on the shelves how few of the volumes, the spines that we can see, are leather uh, brown um, amongst all of the various books. Some of them, I think, were either family books or ones he bought secondhand and had already been bound. Because over a hundred titles are just in wrappers like these books here uh, or have no cover at all. And it seems to have been a deliberate choice for Smithson to just leave his books as he bought them, functional but unfinished. It's extremely unusual, and it makes the library as a collection a book historian's treasure trove. I'm waiting for someone to come along and make a thorough study of these um, paper wrappers and books as issued. Now, another interesting point is that Heather has pointed out to me that many classic works in Smithson's field simply are not present. Indeed, there were several significant scientists whose works are wholly lacking in the collection. And these were close colleagues of Smithson's, men with whom he had worked, traveled, and collected. Now, it's very possible that he did have their books at some time, but Heather documents in her biography at least two points in his travels on the continent during the Napoleonic era when Smithson lost trunks of books and other personal possessions. We may never know what they were. And in fact, it turns out that we don't even have all of the books that originally came with the bequest. Heather's comment prompted me to do some digging and in the library accession ledger of the National Institute, the Smithsonian's predecessor, uh, which initially held the bequest, I found not only the 116 titles listed in the 1880 report, but an additional 16, which weren't in the report and are not now in the library, or weren't when I was doing <laughs> this research. Further investigation actually located eight of them at the Library of Congress, identified by um, inscriptions to Smithsonian, as you can see here, um, a Monsieur Smithson, homage de l'auteur, and also the little number at the top of the wrapper, 1161, I think it is, or four, is the library ledger accession number but it is inside an envelope with a big magic marker Library of Congress call number for when they were holding it up in their stacks. Uh, also, we use things like uh, the National Institute property stamps and Smithson's own annotations in some cases, as we see here, um, which were um, identified by Heather because actually I think this was in a book that did not have any other indication, but um, we used his handwriting here to prove that it must have been his and therefore ours. 
<clears throat> the Library of Congress, I'm delighted to say, very graciously returned all eight of those that we had identified, and they are now part of the Smithson Library. But others listed in that ledger are still missing, so the hunt continues. All in all, these physical characteristics show that Smithson read, thought about, and even responded to the books that he had. Heather's and Steve's books both draw on these comments and marks, the faint clues that survive to tell us his interests and opinions, his thoughts, and sometimes his inner life. And back to Heather. Thank you so much, Leslie. That's wonderful. So the rest of the website, as you can see, moves into the, the creation of the Smithsonian and its history over the course of nearly 200 years now, and um, highlighting a variety of people, collections, events, and initiatives throughout um, the course of, of uh, these last two centuries. So. Um, I'm really looking forward to the Smithsonian Library's next program at, on August 31, which will be um, looking more at that second half of the website and talking more about today. Um, and so I hope you'll join us uh, again for that. And uh, we'd be happy to answer questions that any of you might have. Thank you so much, Heather, and all of our speakers for that fascinating look at the life of our founder. I, um, I've heard from all of you several times, but there's always something that I come away with, um, with a, a new respect for, for your work and for him. So thank you again. And I do want to um, follow up and, and really highlight our next talk, which will be August 31st, Smithson to Smithsonian Expanding Our Legacy. And for that second program, we'll highlight Smithsonian staff who are currently working to restore, highlight, and amplify cultural heritage from historically marginalized communities. Uh, and that'll be a panel moderated by our director, Tamar Evangelista Doherty. So please stay tuned for that and make sure you're on our mailing list so you can get all the, the details for that. So um, we do have a couple of questions queued up in our Q&A. And again, I will remind folks to please take advantage of that Q&A button so we can keep track of, of your burning questions and what we've addressed. Um, and so um, one of the first questions is, pardon me while I navigate, what financial support did Smithson receive from his father and what did he inherit from his mother? How was his fortune made? That was a question that I was deeply, deeply interested in and um, and we are still uh, looking at today. I'm really excited that uh, one of my Smithsonian Archives colleagues is actually going to be in London in August working on this very question. Um, amazingly, Smithson's bank account uh, information, much of it, not all of it, but much of it still exists today at Hoare's Bank in London. And uh, there's a photo of that ledger uh, in the website. And so that gives a window into his finances and, um, and what he was doing. It also helped me to track where he was at different times. Um, and I looked uh, extensively for proof that there was funding from the Duke, um, who also banked at Hoare's, as did Smithson's mother. Um, and I was I, I was able to see that there was a lawyer um, who had dealings with both Smithson's mother and Smithson's father, but it wasn't so simple that you could see that there was an amount of money that went from the Duke to the lawyer to the mother. So um, so I could did not feel I could conclusively say that Smithson was receiving funding from his father, but the Duke had several other illegitimate children who were supported. Um, and so it's very possible that there was money. His his mother, as um, as we discussed earlier, was quite wealthy herself, and she left um, Smithson ten thousand pounds in her will. Uh, she was 
um, an extravagant spender, carriages, dresses from Paris, you name it. And um, so she left him definitely much less than she might have done. She also sold the only property that he might have inherited from her um, about 10 years before um, she died inexplicably uh, after spending years in court trying to um, gain control of it uh, from other family members. And um, anyway, the fortune that he left in his in his will was over 100,000 pounds. So more than 10 times what his mother's um, legacy was to him. He seems to have been quite a shrewd investor. He was uh, very engaged in um, stocks and bonds, um, but a lot is still not known of, um, of his finances. I don't know if you have more to add to that, Steve. Um, I was just going to mention that, that Smithson, you know, as part of his science, he funded all his research, all his travel, you know, as unlike a modern scientist who applies for grants and, and tries to get uh, uh, funding through the government, Smithson was completely independent. Um, so it's just a connection with his finances. Thank you. There was a lot of interest in his finances in the Q&A, and I think that you guys have, have covered all of that. Thank you. Um, a question for Leslie. Uh, were off-prints considered publications? And you are muted, Leslie. Sorry. Um, they were certainly published in journals, and um, they were exchanged, you know, pre-internet days, the only way for people to uh, share their work with their colleagues and uh, receive uh, their others in return. Um, I'm not quite sure what the question is after, but I will say uh, nowadays, we have cataloged all of the off prints in Smithson's library, including his own, as separate publications just for our records. But in general, in the libraries, we do not catalog um, individual articles from journals because we have the journal normally. Um, so uh, there's their publications certainly, um, but it sort of depends on perhaps the li any individual library's own definition of what they choose to catalog as a as a, uh, a freestanding separate entity. Um, and generally we do not do that for off prints, but we have done for Smithsons. And while we have you on the subject of his library, there's a question about the preservation of the books and are there any um, notions of providing something a bit better than what they're in now or what could be available in a leather binding? Ah, uh, no. Um, <clears throat> actually our conservators have done a lot of work over time. They have um, treated those slip cases, which themselves are potentially harmful to the books inside them because they're made from 19th century acidic materials. Um, but the books inside them are wrappered in a barrier paper normally. Uh, and beyond that, we will not go. Our policy is not to perk up or prettify books and to maintain them as long as they remain functional in their original state as we received them. Um, and this is in part because the books as physical evidence are important in um, the history of making books. And we have researchers who come to us uh, looking at books as physical objects, um, different kinds of bindings, hopefully different kinds of paper wrappers. Um, and so we preserve the book as in its original structure and materials as much as possible. Um, we have repaired books certainly to make them functional, but we um, intrude as little as possible. That's, that's a general conservation policy and, and principle nowadays, I think. Thank you, Leslie. Um, and a question a couple of people are interested to know is how many languages does, did James speak, Smithson speak and write? We know English and French, how about others? 
I'll just say before Heather goes into it, she's probably the expert, that he had books in um, mostly French and English. In fact, more in French than English, um, but none, I or were there any in German? Maybe one or two. Um, and uh, so there weren't books. And there's one in, one in Italian, at it, least. That's right, there's yeah. one in Italian. Um, but that was the extent of it for his book. So Heather, what else do you mind? Uh, I mean, if the language that science was conducted in at that time was was primarily French. And so, in fact, when I was I was working in the archives in Berlin and was, um, you know, really happy to see that even the proceedings of the Berlin Academy of Sciences were actually printed in in French. Um, so I don't know if he knew German. It's possible. He definitely spent time there. Um, he probably knew Latin and Greek. Uh, you know, for reading purposes. Um, and he spent a lot of time in Italy, so I wouldn't be surprised also if he knew some Italy. He was extremely fluent in French and he was mistaken um, occasionally for being French. Um, so for sure that was one of his primary languages. We've had a couple of questions in the chat, um, folks that want to hear more about the stories of him being imprisoned. Um, what did he do time for? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I, I, I can try to take a, uh, get a start on this one anyway. Um, uh, you have to remember that Smithson was, was living and traveling during the Napoleonic Wars. And uh, during a break in the wars, uh, the so-called Peace of Amiens, um, English uh, tourists went to Paris in great droves and um, uh, it looked like the peace was going to last and then it didn't and Napoleon expelled all the English. Unfortunately Smithson had just gotten to France and didn't want to go back to England so he headed off towards the continent and um, the, the, the French appear to have assumed that he was a spy and and we're following him around and and eventually i assume that's that's why he was arrested but i think heather knows the rest of this story much better than i do well i um he did want to get home again you know uh as steve said people came over to paris because it had been almost a decade of war at that point and they were eager to explore the city and um the fashion and all the latest um news and things like that. And, um, and so there were a ton of English that got caught up and, um, and some of them were imprisoned um, at that time, but Smithson had already left, um, left Paris and he spent time traveling around Germany and other places. And he was waiting, um, I believe, because he was terribly, terribly seasick. He, um, he really hated sea travel. And I imagine that if he hadn't hated sea travel so much, perhaps he might have even come to the United States at some point. But um, for him, he had already returned to England once on an earlier trip to Europe via the North Sea, and it had been a horrendous experience. And so he pretty much was you know, saying to himself, I'm going to wait this out and eventually there'll be another break in the war and I'll be able to go back home through the very shortest distance between Calais and Dover across the channel. And that's what I want to do because I want to spend the least amount of time possible on a boat. And he waited four years. And so I think eventually he was like, okay, this war is never ending and I am just going to have to um, you know, I'm just gonna have to deal and I'm gonna have to go up to um, the North Sea. So he was actually on his way home via Denmark, uh, which was neutral, and probably imagined that he was fine. Um, but he happened to arrive in Denmark at the exact moment when England bombed Copenhagen. Um, they were not giving up their Navy um, and England was terrified that France was gonna get the Navy. And so um, England just uh, preemptively 
uh, massively bombed uh, Copenhagen. And so the Danish in total shock uh, basically um, imprisoned all of the English. So he was swept up in what he called the hurricane of war. And, um, and it was several years then before he was able to finally secure um, his freedom. And it was through what um, Steve was talking about as the citizen of the world, this kind of brotherhood of science, um, where they felt that they were working for um, a better society and that science knew no borders. And so um, they were trying to continue their work even while their various countries were at war. And so there were a number of French scientists who lobbied for Smithson release and it was eventually Napoleon who signed off on it and that was what helped um get him home what a story thank you mm -hmm. um and actually to kind of follow up on that story and how you know so much about him since so little um you know remains about Smithson can you talk about some of the sources that you used to uncover all of this great research yes well that was the big question of is how do you how do you tell this story when basically everything's gone and um and i realized that i if i were was able to map his um networks and figure out who his friends were and who his colleagues were and um and where he had been and find him through these other um people's diaries and letters and things like that then it might be possible to even though the center's missing to kind of build um the story back and so i mean that um prisoner of war thing was a great example like i knew he'd been in prisoner of war we had the letter that he'd written telling the story to friend back in england as the kind of one indication of what had been happening to him but i went to denmark to try to figure out if i could find um the police record of his arrest and of course i'm looking at um you know danish script um looking for the word smithson and it took me two days of just pouring through boxes but i eventually um found it so it was that kind of um research and then of course hiring a translator to help me understand what the you know what the pages were actually telling me and things like that but it, it, there were incredible stories and in, in those boxes of things uh, letters that people were writing um, sometimes in English and sometimes in French and telling stories about how they'd been separated from their families and I'm um, just amazing stories of um, these people who'd all been swept up and um, and imprisoned really hmm. incredible. Yeah, if I can just add to that, um, I mean Heather Heather did an extraordinary job of going through archives and and all these 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 um, you know, collections of records. Um, and, and, and filling in the, the Smithson story in a way that had never been done before. So that when I came along, um, I, I did some archive work and of course that's, that's great fun, but, but a lot of what I got on Smithson science was, was through the web, through, through Google books and, and uh, Google search and Google search in French and Google search in German and Russian and you know, da, da, da. Um, and, and so I was able to, un, unlike any researcher who's looked at Smithson before, I was able to go and, and see all the journals that were talking about his articles and, and follow these paths down little rabbit holes and find these little nuggets of information. Um, and so, so I'm, I'm a great, great beneficiary of the, the digital age. And I, I, I did want to give that credit as well. I love archives, but the web is pretty great. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and so, you know, talking about how sort of reconstructing Smithson's world and and um, his thoughts and beings, here's the the million dollar question: Is can you kind of speculate on why he left this fortune to the United States? Hmm. Um, well, I guess I guess I should take that one too, since since I'm the one that did, did the latest uh, talk on that subject. Um, but but my research in his science, I was I was amazed at how much information Smithson's science had about Smithson, the man. And, and in, in reading his, his articles closely, 
I, I realized that, that Smithson was deeply interested in, in science education, and it's particularly science education for working people at, at his time, which is a big political issue. Um, so here's, here's that one case where Smithson was almost involved in politics. Um, but, but yeah, essentially when Smithson went to England in 1826 to write his will, there was a, a culmination of a big movement called the Mechanics uh, Institutes that um, was, was trying to allow working people to get a, a scientific and technical education for, for advancement and, and to break out of the, the class barriers. And, and so, so I found out that Smithson had this, this lifelong interest in this topic. And when he went to write his will, this, this, this whole movement was just culminating in London and it, um, um, worker education was in the newspapers and everything. Um, Smithson clearly was thinking about it. And then when he went to write his will, I think he realized that there was a very slight possibility that, that his, all his heirs would die before his estate was used up and that, that, uh, um, he could he could direct his funds at, at to go somewhere other than through his family, which most people at that time were were, were very much locked into keeping the fortune in the family, and and so Smithson basically did that most American thing. He he did a hail mary pass. He he <laughs> sent sent his uh, fortune to the United States with with good wishes, and and he. He thought that he was specifying something about the mechanics institutes, about the worker education, but typically he said it in such a terse way that the Americans didn't really get it. Um, or the, the, the creation of an institute like that was, was no longer necessary in the United States when this fortune did arrive. But, but anyway, that's, that's, that's a topic I'm still working on and, and hopefully there'll be a, some sort of publication coming out in the, in the, the future. Uh, with some more information on that. Steve, can you, um, I see another question actually that I think follows is just um, something that you can follow on um, in a good way. Why was the institution given the name Smithsonian instead of Smithson? And ah. that follows what you're talking about. As right, well. right, right, right. Well, well, I mean, it was sort of a naming convention. Um, one of Smithson's idols was uh, John Anderson at the University of Glasgow. And when he died in um, the 1890s, uh, he left his fortune um, uh, to found uh, an institution that came to be called the Andersonian. And um, so then, then uh, when Smithson was at Oxford, the, the science museum there was, was called the Ashmolean, named after Mr. Ashmole. Uh, so it was a, it was a logical thing for Smithson to, to name the institution after himself, uh, even though he had, other than sending his money to the United States, he had nothing to do with the founding of it. Um, but, but Smithsonian made sense and it seems like a fitting tribute to him. Thank you. Um, now let's, uh, unless anybody else has anything they'd like to add to that. I think we'll, we'll turn our attention back to my personal favorite, the, the books, Leslie. <laughs> um, first, a, a quick question that I think I, I can probably answer, which is, are we've had a couple of people ask the same question. Are the Smithson personal library books digitized? And some are. Uh, you can use the link that I added to the chat to see all of the library books in our library catalog and where they are digitized, which I believe, Leslie, correct me if I'm wrong, I think there are about 30 titles that we've digitized. I'm not sure how many have been done in their entirety. We did a lot of scanning and I think that's up on the galaxy or, or whatever links you've got of um, individual pages and portions of books for Heather when she was doing her research. Um, and so uh, there's those, but in terms of the entire book, I'm not sure, I'm not sure. We haven't focused on it specifically. Um, it's a possible project down the road for uh, scanning efforts. Thanks. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just mention that the um, library catalog link that I added to the chat, uh, any books that have been digitized, the links to their digital uh, versions will be right in next to their titles there. Mm, so please the check them out online. And it's good to know there's so many, so much interest in seeing these books digitized as well. Yeah, yeah, it's an interesting idea. Thanks. Um, and Leslie, while we have you, can you talk a little bit more about the two works of literature that were in Smithson's collection? Uh, 
Uh, well, one of them is the works of Samuel Johnson. Um, 12 volumes, I think, um, that we showed one of his little annotations on. Um, I have no idea why he would have those, except for the fact that Johnson was um, an alumnus of the same college at Oxford, uh, Pembroke, that Smithson went to. So um, Heather may be able to expand on it. The other work of literature is a total mystery to me, uh, if I'm remembering the right one. It's, it's um, in French, and it's something about mon bonnet de nuit, my nightcap, uh, night hat, you know, as people used to wear when they went to bed. And I know nothing at all about it, I'm sorry to say. So Heather, what do you know? I was just gonna say, my book came out in 2007 and that is gone if I knew that information. <laughs> it's, it's no longer with me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I have, I think they might've been accidental. And actually, you know, to tell you the truth about the French one, for example, there are so many books on French politics and memoirs relating to the, uh, the royalty, the exiled king or, you know, what have you. Um, and I really wonder, was James Smithson that interested in that stuff? Um, the estate went to a nephew for six years after Smithson died before the nephew died and then the US came into the picture. Um, but the nephew owned it. He lived in France. He was married to a French woman. And I'm, I'm wondering if it's possible that some of <clears throat> things some of his own books might have gotten mixed in, and maybe that's where this French nightcap poem <laughs> or whatever it is came into the collection. Um, I don't really know. There is certainly one item in the library that must have been the nephews because it's dated 1834, which is five years after Smithson died <clears throat> and only two years before the nephew. It was one of the museum guides, Heather, I think, to. Um, what did it was it Bullock's exhibition? I'm not sure which one, but uh, it was clearly a little, you know, uh, something that slipped in from, I presume, the nephew's collection. Um, so maybe, as I say, maybe that's where the uh, French literature item came from. I should look into it. Thank you. Um, and I, we are about six minutes out and I apologize. I can, we have so many questions and I'm sure that we're not going to be able to get to every single one of them. Um, but we do have time for just a few more. Um, and here's a great question about Smithson as a scientist, which is, was publication of 26 papers considered a, a good scientific output output in Smithson's day? Was, uh, was that successful? Well, good, good question. And I, I hadn't thought about that, but I'm happy to think about it. Um, I mean, the, the scientific achievement is more for, for quality than quantity. Um, and certain, certainly Smithson had a lot of scientific achievements. So in that respect, he had, he had a, an excellent career. Um, a lot of his articles were, um, now we wouldn't necessarily consider them scientific. You know, his, his, his article about uh, coffee making and such. Um, but but um, uh, during his lifetime, Smithson was, was highly respected and, and a lot of his articles were widely read. So I, I think he had a very successful and productive scientific career. I don't, I don't think there's really any doubt about that. Thank you. So we still have a lot of questions about why did Smithson leave this money to the U.S.? Why, <laughs> why across the pond? Um, and some connected questions like was Smithson aware of Benjamin Franklin and Thomas Jefferson when they visited Paris? What, what other ties can we, we build to, to him in America? Well, I, I, can, I can start off on that. Um... Uh, I don't think Smithson knew Jefferson or um, uh, Franklin, even though they were in Europe sort of around his time. I don't think there was any contact between them. Um, 
and I'm sorry, what was, what was the other question? <laughs> Why the but there, Yeah, But I, I can add, yeah. just um, yeah. going staying with Franklin and Jefferson for a moment, um, Franklin does die in 1790, so there isn't likely to be overlap. However, um, when they make that trip to Scotland uh, and, you know, when Smithson's 19, um, they're toasting to Franklin and Jefferson at night, and they're toasting to the United States, uh, which is, um, you know, brand new at that point, and um, hasn't even, um, that's 1784, that trip, and so it's even pre our constitution, but, um, you know, the establishment of the United States uh, was this epic event in, um, in Smithson's lifetime, and, um, and, you know, he's in Oxford, um, which is this extremely conservative Tory place, you know, that's very pro um, the empire and not happy about uh, the, you know, losing to the um, rebel colonists. And so, um, you know, Smithson's part of this kind of community that is seeing a different kind of future. And especially when you think about how troubled he was about his illegitimacy and not being recognized um, in society. Um, the idea that there was a place where there was a different foundation um, for a society. So even though it's obviously deeply, deeply flawed and imperfect, um, but the premise of people being um, valued for their um, for their contributions and uh, society being organized around science and laws and not um, you know religion and um, er, um, ancestry and and other things that were what um, you know the ancien regime and in France and and the world that he lived in in England also were um, how they were structured. And so the United States would have seemed like um, the foundations for a different kind of society to Smithson. And so um, the Smithsonian today leaves off the last two little words of the bequest, you know, um, an institution for the increase and diffusion of knowledge among men. And we've just kind of gotten rid of that um, because it, it sounds like it's leaving out half the population. And so we don't want to like emphasize that side of it anymore. But I feel like there was actually, um, that meant humankind in Smithson's day. And so that meant actually, it wasn't just a gift to the United States in my reading of this. It was saying, I am a citizen of the world and I am imagining, um, an institution that is uh, working towards betterment of humanity. And I see the United States as the place that is best able to be the trustee of this gift and to make it for, um, you know, for the wider world. So obviously that's a very rosy interpretation, but that's, um, that's how I read it. So. Well, we're right at six o'clock and I feel like that is, that is an excellent place to leave off really. So thank you very much. Thank you again to all of our presenters, Emily, Heather, Leslie, Steve. Again, we have recorded this and we'll make it available afterwards. Um, I've just popped an event survey link into the chat for our attendees today. Sorry we couldn't get to all of these wonderful questions, but I hope that we did answer a lot of your, your burning questions about our founder, James Smithson, and we look forward to sharing so much more with you. Um, when Smithson to Smithsonian fully launches. So thank you all so much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.